There they go, marching all in step so gay, smooth-cheeked and golden, food for shells and guns. Blithely they go, as to a wedding day, the mother's sons. The drab street stairs to see them, row on row, on the high tram tops, singing like the lark. Too careless gay for courage, singing they go into the dark. This Hall of Honour tells a story, and it's the story of how Trinity College Dublin confronted the trauma of the Great War. 3,000 staff, students and alumni joined up to fight in the armed forces. 471 of them died. But that wasn't the only involvement. Trinity academics were engaged in the war fully. They were engaged in the arguments of the time. They conducted scientific projects with the War Office. Trinity was fully engaged, like other universities internationally, in the conflict. But the Easter Rising in 1916, the War of Independence and the Irish Revolution changed Ireland, and in particular, changed the place of Trinity within it. The old Trinity died in 1914, and a new Trinity, the Trinity that we know and live in, only really emerged in the 1950s. In between, in the 1920s and the 1930s, a cautious, shaken institution tried to negotiate its place in the new state. And this had a tremendous effect on the memory of the war within college. Internally, the community of Trinity, suffering from the loss of those nearly 500 soldiers, commemorated the war by building this Hall of Honour. It was planned in 1919, and the idea was always that it would be the entryway, the sacred entryway, to a new library building, which was much needed. But because the two projects were separately funded, the Hall of Honour was completed in 1928, the reading room not until 1937. For nine years, this Hall of Honour stood alone as a solemn testament to the sacrifice of the Trinity men who fell in the Great War. When the complex as a whole was inaugurated by Eamon de Valera in 1937, it became known as the 1937 Reading Room. And thereafter, and particularly after the Second World War, the whole complex took on that name. It was as if the memory of the war itself had become effaced. People saw but didn't see the Hall of Honour. And that's why on this 100th anniversary of the Great War, and in particular of the fighting in 1915 in which Trinity was so heavily represented, we are in a sense rededicating the Hall of Honour. I suppose one could think of it as a recovery of that lost memory of Trinity in the Great War and an act of reparation to the men who fell in it. The Dean family were one of the obvious candidates to put up such a building. Thomas Manley Dean had earlier made designs for the erection of a building in Fellow Square, which was of an octagonal shape, connected to the very middle of the long room, of the long room and, and old library, and sticking out into the middle of what was then open space. Um, so he reverted in 1920 uh, to the idea of putting up just such a building between the West Pavilion of the Old Library and the uh, Public Theatre or Exam Hall. So the building really uh, took the shape of uh, a hybrid building, uh, a reading room and uh, the vestibule in front which we know as the Hall of Honour. But the whole thing was initially conceived as a single war memorial, erected in two phases. So the Hall of Honour was erected first, and the reading room, the octagonal reading room behind it, uh, was erected a few years afterwards. For his solution for the Hall of Honour part of the building facing into um, Front Square, um, Dean decided to put up what is really a very close replica of a building which already existed in the college, in the Fellows Garden, uh, which was the Magnetic Observatory, which had been designed by Frederick Darley in the 1830s. A little Greek Doric building, 
And the present Hall of Honour, like Darley's Magnetic Observatory, is very beautifully detailed. Uh, the Portland stone detail is really very fine. It's all very, very learned and very exquisitely chiselled and built. What's important for me is the, that the design resonates with the building itself, that it responds to the architecture that's already there and that history that's built up. So uh, the hall itself is essentially a, a temple uh, format. It's of the Doric order, which is a quite a robust architecture and symmetry is, is a sort of dominant feature there. You've got quite strong, robust materials in the granite in particular and Portland stone are the two main, uh, main materials. So, it made sense to use the Portland stone. It's good for letter carving and it's again, you're using the same material so you have immediately have that connection. The Roman capital is, is very much an architectural feature and it's what I've worked with here. You'll find it inside the hall in the lettering. It's, it's a V-cut letter so you're creating light and shade much like most architectural feature when you peel them back. It's actually about turning light and shade and creating creating a form that way. So it holds that gravitas um, and is robust. Again, you come back to the architecture and the setting of it. And these as shapes and forms and details work with our, with this type of architecture and they're sort of part of part of the same language. Few institutions in Ireland were more deeply engaged in the First World War than this college. Thousands of Trinity students, staff and graduates fought and almost 500 died in military service during the First World War and its aftermath. Engagement on such a scale in a conflict whose length and human cost no one had anticipated devastated the Trinity community, and that is not too strong a word. It's vital that, as a country, we acknowledge the entirety of our history and do not value certain narratives at the expense of others. In Trinity, we are proud of the part that our graduates and staff have played in ending the silence that has surrounded participation in the First World War. Edmund Burke, put the importance of a nation coming to terms with its history most starkly when he said, those who don't know history are destined to repeat it. And by rededicating this memorial, let us remind ourselves not to repeat it, that this poignant list of war dead, like so many other such lists in memorials the length and breadth of Europe, is a reminder of the destructiveness of war and the virtues of peace and negotiation. I now call on the Pro-Chancellor, Professor Dermot McAleese, to officially unveil the memorial stone.
With tin whistles, mouth organs, any noise, they pipe the way to glory in the grave. Foolish and young, the gay and golden boys love cannot save. High heart, high courage, the poor girls they kissed run with them. They shall kiss no more, alas. Out of the mist they stepped, into the mist singing they passed.